everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining me. My name is Peter Hanks, Junior Analyst for DailyFX.com. Today we're going to be going through some equity index analysis. As always, I'm sure you're all well aware that the past few days and now a few weeks really have been uh, pretty record setting by many, many metrics. So we have a lot to talk about. We just got a 50 basis point surprise emergency Fed rate cut yesterday. So uh, that's going to be at the top of the list alongside some of the price extremes that we've been seeing. Um, but without further ado, let's begin with a quick risk disclaimer. Hello, Patrick. Hello to everyone else in the chat. Thanks for joining. So, as I mentioned, the Federal Reserve came out about this time yesterday and announced a 50 basis point cut effective immediately. And that marked the first intra meeting cut since the collapse of Lehman Brothers in 2008. So, over a decade since we've got an emergency rate cut like that. And there, subsequent evidence was the adverse economic impacts of the coronavirus. Chairman Powell came out and essentially highlighted the risks and the uncertainty, but he also conceded that, you know, identifying the, the absolute depth and the possible duration of this headwind is very difficult and it's not really something the Fed is capable of because many other institutions uh, aren't either but his willingness to ease and kind of prop up the market and the economy was mirrored in other major central banks like Australia the Bank of Japan, this morning the Bank of Canada, which also followed through with a 50 basis point rate cut. So there's alarm across the board from these central banks. There's also been talks of fiscal stimulus in many, many countries, including the United States. Uh, I think an eight, I'll have to double check on the figures, but um, there's talks of an aid package from the Senate this morning. So as we can see, there's a very concerted effort to come together and combat the larger economic impacts. And because of that larger effort, it's actually kind of resulted in a little bit of um, unease. The rate cut yesterday and we traded higher at the onset, but eventually let me bring up a uh, price chart here, actually. We traded higher initially, but once investors and traders started to kind of think about what the rate cut actually meant, I think it was somewhat widely accepted that the drawdown or the potential drawdown could actually be deeper than many analysts had previously thought. So because of that, there was a little bit of worry um, and that's why we pulled back somewhat yesterday. This morning, up about 2% or thereabouts. And you can see the, uh, the pullback here yesterday but this morning up about two percent and bringing it back to the powerpoint the past two to three weeks have really put us at extremes from a price perspective so here in the blue we have the dow jones going back to 1920 about 100 years of data in purple we have the instances of a decline or a five day period with a decline of 10%, followed by a day of a 5% gain. So last week, the Dow Jones declined around 12%, just rounding it off a little bit. And then on Monday, we got that incredible rally that put us up 
1,300 points on the Dow, which translated to 5.09 or 5.12%. That type of volatility is incredibly infrequent. This is 100 years of data, and apart from the 30s and uh, wartime period in here, so 1940 to present, it's only happened about 16 times. We can look more closely at some other instances where it's happened. Here's one in 2002 during the summer. This is still when the market and the economy was wrestling with the uh, dot-com bubble and the ramifications of it bursting. So weeks and months of declines leading up to it, extreme volatility near the bottom, and you'll notice just because we did get something that fit this um, somewhat cherry-picked stat doesn't mean that we're out of the woods. Uh, a lot of volatility was to come. Now, because it is so volatile and because there is something under the surface in the economy or a larger issue that makes it necessary or that sparks this volatility, uh, it often forces the hand of these central banks. And that's why over the longer term, we'll see across the board generally as we shift to 2007, 2008, that we pull out um, in the positive. Looking here at the number of instances in 2008 after the um, housing crisis and the Great Recession, as it's called, we can see a string of them in late 20 or 2008, and then a few at the absolute bottom in 2009. This about coincides with the Fed cutting rates very significantly down to the floor. And in the weeks to come, as recovery took hold, the Dow Jones began to climb, but there was still volatility after these events. So what I'm trying to get at here is just because we have had this volatility and now we have a, um, a Fed put, or maybe not a put at this point, but more of a, a lifeline, really, um, doesn't mean we're out of the woods. So when we begin looking at technicals, keep that in the back of your mind. There's still a lot of uncertainty rampaging and um, risk management will be very, very important. So now shifting to this week or the present, here's our run up from 2015, 2016, 2017, even the volatility that we got at the end of 2018 where we nearly slipped into a bear market, it didn't really fit the criteria uh, that we've laid out here. This Monday though is the first instance since 2008 it was followed a day later by the Fed cutting by 50 basis points. So maybe they saw my article. I doubt it, but that's where we are now. And holding on to this and leveling off, I think is going to take some follow through from some of the other central banks that haven't done anything yet, or if there's a potential talk of stimulus on the fiscal side. One encouraging thing, but not that encouraging because it's pre-coronavirus, is US, US ISM non-manufacturing PMI. Came out this morning, surged to the highest in over a year at 57.30. Services, which is synonymous with non-manufacturing PMI, is about two thirds of the US economy. So having a really robust figure here is very encouraging. But again, that it hasn't taken into consideration um, the slowdown on the back of the coronavirus. So whether this is just going to make a more extreme drop off next month possible is yet to be seen. But for the time being, uh, it's not hurting sentiment, that's for sure. Now looking to 
the S&P 500 for some technicals. So we fell off the cliff edge uh, there in the last two weeks of February, going from around 3,400 back down to 2,855, which coincides with the October 2019 low. As of yesterday and earlier this morning, we've been trying to surpass this rising trend line here. I know the chart is zoomed out quite far. I apologize. So looking at the highs established back here in January 2018, Touching off the tops in August, September, later that year, again in July 2019, and it provided a little bit of buoyancy there in December 2019. We fell beneath last week. We seem to be leveling off today. There may be a, a corollary effect from Super Tuesday. Mike Bloomberg announced he was dropping out of the presidential race earlier this morning. A number of other candidates have done as well. Joe Biden beat out Bernie Sanders, so Wall Street is certainly rejoicing about that. Uh, I think it's widely accepted that Biden would be the more busily business-friendly candidate of the two. So seeing Sanders slip in the polls could have had some positive impact, but I think over the coming weeks, um, the virus is still going to be the main concern until we get deeper into the presidential race. But from the technical perspective, 3,100, where that trend line lives, and the 200-day simple moving average, both hanging out around that level, 3,094, 3,100. So that's going to be a very, very difficult area to hold above. And then beyond that, we do have this trend line from the December 2018 lows and the October 2019 lows. So that's just narrowly overhead, 31.50, let's call it. On the support side, we got a little bit of a bottom in here and this long lower wick is actually very encouraging, um, followed by a huge candle higher. So early support going to be around 2876 with subsequent assistance potentially coming into play around 2800, 29 or 2790. That comes off the June and August lows. The Nasdaq looking here at a 4 hour chart instead of a daily Got the bounce off confluent support around 8,200. A ton of trend lines in here. I apologize for how messy these charts are. I've just been um, looking for any and all uh, levels going back a few years now. So it's it's produced a, a number of trend lines that I don't usually have on here, um, just because the swings are so wild. So if you move 5% in a day intraday levels aren't really going to mean much. That being said, looks like this area up here around 8,900 could be a barrier in days to come unless we get another surge like this or maybe some willingness on the fiscal side um, with support still existing around 8,200. The Dow Jones Trading almost picture perfect at the same level as the January 2018 high around 26,750. You zoom out, you'll notice circle here where we are today and uh, a similar circle over here. And that is where we're at. So that's going to be the nearest form of resistance joined by this ascending band beneath for some support. 
It didn't really do too much last week, but if volatility slows down a little bit, we might see it play some role uh, before subsequent areas come into play. Mainly this one at the June 2019 low around 24,620. So the US seems to have leveled off. Now we're negotiating some pretty major resistance to the top side. And because we did far fall so far so fast, um, there's going to be quite a number of technical levels to take out. Just clicking, just, excuse me, I apologize. Just taking a quick look at the Russell here. A while back, I noted the range that it was stuck in. This was probably around November when we were talking about it because it was just struggling to break above this level at 1600 took weeks of probing this barrier to finally break above, get some gains under its belt before it ran into another level of resistance at 17.15. Well, the, those months of progress were erased about 10 days here. Now we're back at the bottom of that trading range around 1,500. Um, tagging lows around 14.45. So for the Russell, unfortunately it may fall back into this range and just kind of meander around in there for some time. Uh, it's really ripe for range trading opportunities in my opinion. You can see how cleanly it plays off these levels. Uh, that's not to say that it's going to do the same in the future. It very well may not but something to keep an eye on for sure, especially if that's your trading strategy. Now looking to the DAX. Again, uh, a chart that we've been talking about a ton in the past. It was one of my favorites. I really had some, uh, some picture perfect levels outlined on here. So I was, very eager to take a look at the declines and see if we got any bounces off the levels that I had. It looks like this morning and the past few days, we've been trying to break above this trend line from December 2018 lows. Uh, it kind of works to make that rising channel. It's the lower bound of that. So reclaiming that and hanging out around the 12, 400 mark, um, prior to this resistance would be an early sign that we're attempting to continue higher, but I think we'd need a, a pretty substantial close above this lower bound to really say with confidence that uh, further gains are in store. Interestingly for the European Central Bank, I guess also the Bank of Japan, their rates are already at zero or negative. So the Fed came out with a 50 basis point cut, as did the Bank of Canada. RBA came out with 25 basis points. This goes back to something that we've been talking about at length over the past year, um, at least, is that when your rates do get so low and a real shock comes about, you're left with less ammunition uh, to act and to actually effectively help the economy. That's where the ECB is, that's where the BOJ is, the Fed cutting by 50, it's moving closer to that point. Um, and we also have the March 18th Fed meeting coming up. Futures are already pricing in a 25 basis point cut there at least. So there's even inklings that another 50 basis point cut is possible. The market hasn't really been wrong about it's forecasting of cuts recently. So if they're pricing in a cut, more likely than not, um, the Fed is going to deliver that cut. Now, it becomes a question of who's leading that. Is it the Fed truly acting on what it's seeing? Is it the market forcing the Fed's hand? Is it pressure from the Trump administration, specifically Donald Trump himself, President Trump? Um, that's, we don't really have insight into that, but what we do know 
is the European Central Bank is effectively as low as it can go right now. So fiscal policy is going to most likely be their uh, avenue to combat any drawdown. Something we talked about earlier in the year, there were already rumors of it, especially in Germany, because they are running a, a budget surplus. So if they can move anything around there, that may boost their economy and in turn help the DAX. But in the meantime, I expect it to lag the U.S. indices a little bit. It just doesn't quite have the same gusto, I guess, if you will, that, uh, that the Dow Jones, the NASDAQ, and the S&P do. So this trend line going to probably be a major barrier over the coming days. If we get up into that confluent area around 12,500, uh, that'll only increase the resistance further. So that's it for the technicals today. Quickly looking at the economic calendar because we do have some data coming out. Beige book later today, I don't think that will really do too much at all because so much has shifted since that was likely compiled. So I think what is more important coming up on Friday is jobs data because now that we've got the lower rates from the Fed, we're closer to zero. We got something many analysts were calling for, for the rate cuts, but investors, traders, analysts, central bank officials, government officials, pretty much all agree that the impact of the coronavirus is going to be a very short term lived issue. It's not going to be structural. You're not going to lose huge swaths of your population and never return to growth that you had previously. It's just kind of like a, a poor retail spending holiday. Um, people don't get out, maybe because of weather. In this case, it's a virus. So conferences are being canceled, travel slowing, all that stuff. Um, most likely, many people are still employed. The economy is still strong. Unemployment is therefore very important. Um, if we do start to see major pullbacks in the employment because people are being laid off, whether they can't go into the office or the economy just slowed so much during that time, that could have longer term impacts. But for the time being, it's looking to be like a very short-term lived issue. So the question becomes, once we've weathered this viral outbreak, if it's three months, six months, or a year even, um, early numbers coming out of China suggest that it's going to be about a month and a half, two months. Um, if it is that short and the Fed cuts rates further or keeps them at their current level, once the economy starts to pick up again, is the Fed going to start hiking? And if so, what will that do to equities down the line? It's too soon to tell, but that is something that's going to be a major topic of conversation in the months to come and something I'll be keeping an eye on. And gaining further insight on that, jobs number is going to be very important. But that was about it for this week. Uh, Alta asks, what U.S. ETF can be traded as a surrogate for the DAX? Uh, that is a good question, actually. I would almost say the Euro, um, Euro USD, in a way, can function similarly, almost inverse. Um, there are a few issues to be had with that, but... As far as ETFs go for the DAX, um, let me try and pull it up on another chart here. I don't actually trade the DAX ETF. Um, I just trade DAX directly, but it looks like EWG uh, is a MISCI Germany ETF. I don't know if it shares the exact makeup of the DAX, but um, 
from a technical perspective, it looks like it does not at all. Price is all over the place here. So EWG, if you're interested in that, but it doesn't look like it lines up one-to-one uh, -one with the DAX. So be careful with that one. Um, the Euro, like I said, much more liquidity. Currency markets in general have just orders of magnitude more liquidity than these regional ETFs, which makes them much more attractive in my opinion. You're always, or just about, always going to get your order filled when you're trading the Euro just because it's the most liquid currency pair in the world. Um, the technicals obviously aren't one-to-one -one with the DAX, but there is some analysis to be done there as well. That being said, I'd like to thank you all for joining me. Thank you for the great questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them. I'll attach this recording to an article later today. It's going to be on DAX technicals. It'll be on the front page of Daily Effects in about an hour and a half here. So you can find the recording there if you missed any part or want to rewatch. Um, but until then, I'll see you tomorrow for my client sentiment webinar or alternatively next week, same time, same place for some more equities. Thanks again and have a great week.